Years ago, someone gave me a list of things that mother taught me. This is a sampling of just a few out of that list. I've always liked them. Number one, my mom taught me to appreciate a job well done. She said, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. <laughs> my mom taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. <laughs> my mom taught me about weather. It looks like a tornado swept through this room. And here's my favorite. Mom taught me about taking responsibility for my actions. If you fall out of that tree and break both your legs, don't come running to me. <laughs> I don't know of a better place to talk about motherhood than Proverbs 31. And I know that for a lot of ladies, it's kind of a challenge to read it because the standard is so high. But I want to encourage you Christian mothers today. God gives you the strength. God gives you that ability. And a woman that fears the Lord, we're going to learn, she shall be praised. And that's the source and the strength of your godly motherhood, is a woman who fears the Lord. So I want to look at Proverbs 31, and we are in this chapter, given wise words of a mother for her son. Notice it in verse 1. It says, are the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So it seems that the king penned these words, but they're given to him by his mother. So what we have in Proverbs 31 are the words of a wise and godly mother to her son about the qualities he should look for in a virtuous woman or in a woman of value and praise. So what a blessing that is. Now, who is King Lemuel Verse 1, it's believed traditionally by the Jews that it is a reference to Solomon. Now, we can't be sure about that, but it seems that it was a kind of a nickname that means one who is chosen or honored by God that maybe his mother gave to him. So the question secondly is now who is the mother who's giving this king these wise words? And the best guess is that it's actually Beth. Sheba. Now, given her background and her story, it's kind of interesting that she would learn from experience the importance of being a virtuous woman and also the importance of teaching her son the dangers of women and the dangers of wine and the importance of a woman who fears the Lord. So it's a wonderful thing when a mother can give her sons and daughters wise counsel. And as we're going to see in this chapter, that a woman who fears the Lord is a woman who counsels her children in the ways of the Lord. So Proverbs 31 is a, pa is a prayer for her son and a pattern for her daughters. I love what Herbert Locker said. He said, Christian mothers are the world's greatest asset, the greatest human influence, and the most wholesome and substantial contribution to human society comes from our mothers, and I agree totally. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Amen? What an influence godly mothers can have upon our lives. Now, in this chapter, verses 1 to 9, which we're not really going to look at, we see her warning her son of two things. Verse 3, watch out for women. And verse 4, stay away from wine. So here's a mother's counsel to her son. Be careful of women. Not just all women but women that will lead you the wrong direction. Sensual lust will destroy your life. So I think that the mother should be the one who's teaching in the home as well as the father taking the lead. But a mother's influence in teaching her son. Watch out, verse 3, for women. Look at it real quickly with me. Give not thy strength. That's the problem. Giving your strength to women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. And then in verse 4, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings, so the emphasis is in the repetition, to drink wine for the rulers to desire strong drink. So she warns her son about the dangers of wild women and wine in these two verses. Then in verses 10 to verse 31, the ones that we are most familiar with and the ones we're going to focus on, she gives her son in these verses the ABCs of what kind of woman to look for when choosing a wife. Now, that's something a mother wants to do, right? Let me set you down. Let me tell you this is what you look for. 
in a wife. And when I say ABCs, I mean literally ABCs from verse 10 to verse 31 is a Hebrew acrostic. And each one of those verses opens with a different alphabet from the Hebrew alphabet. And we know that it's an alphabetical psalm or a proverb, excuse me, because they memorized it or it was used to put to memory. I believe the second most important decision that anyone will make in life is who you marry. You say, well, what's the first most important decision? Trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, amen? Giving your heart to Jesus Christ. Whether you're a woman or a man, we all need to trust the Lord, make sure that we have a relationship with the Lord, and then we marry in the Lord, looking for a godly woman or a godly man. It's so very important. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what in common hath light with darkness, Christ with Belial. So it's important that you marry only in the Lord. Someone once said that if you marry, if you're a child of God and you marry a child of the devil, you're going to have problems with your in-laws. That's true. So don't be so foolish, but look for qualities that are spiritual. Now just a little tip to you single folks that are considering getting married. You can learn a lot by outward observation. You don't need to get involved emotionally or uh, intimately with somebody to know them. You observe them. Are they showing characteristics of a love for Jesus Christ? And you can observe that before you get drawn into a relationship with them. And you only should be attracted to that spiritual aspect. Not that you shouldn't have a physical attraction, that's important as well, but the priority should be the spiritual qualities of their life a woman or a man who fears the Lord. It's so very, very important. Now, this mother in verse 10 to verse 31 is telling her son to look for a woman, verse 10, that is virtuous. Look at it. Who can find a virtuous, there it is, woman, for her price or worth is far above rubies. Now, the word virtuous means noble of character, or a woman of excellence. Some translations have a woman of valor. But I like the concept of excellence. She's a woman of excellence and character. Now, two things about this woman are mentioned in verse 10. She's hard to find. And then in verse 10, her price is far above rubies. Notice she's hard to find. Who can find? And then her price is above rubies. So she's rare and she is valuable. So if you find a virtuous woman, you have found a good thing. Write down Proverbs 18, verse 22, where the writer of Proverbs says, Whoso finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Then write down Proverbs 12, verse 4. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. So it's a blessing to find a virtuous woman. You know, I looked it up. And the only woman in the Bible that is called virtuous is actually Ruth. And we read about Ruth in the book of Ruth. She's called virtuous. And you can study the book of Ruth and see the beautiful love story between Ruth and Boaz and see the picture of a virtuous woman. In Ruth chapter 3, verse 11, Boaz, in speaking of her, said, All the city of my people know that thou art a virtuous woman. So she's the kind of woman, we're going to see it in just a moment, verse 28, whose children rise up and call her blessed, and her husband praises her in the gates. I woke up early this morning, and, or I was laying in bed, woke up early this morning. I actually woke up late. My alarm was set for p.m., not a.m. So I'm only here today because of my virtuous wife. who said, Arise, O sleeper, Christ shall give thee light. She says, aren't you the pastor at Revival? I think there's church today. I mean, you should get up. But I was thinking about my grandmother Miller on my dad's side of the family, what a godly woman she was and what a blessing. Still brings joy to my heart to think about her love for Jesus and her prayers for me and the birthday card she used to send me with the proverb scriptures in it that used to speak to my heart. And then I think of my own mother who loved the Lord and read the Word and studied the Word and 
influenced my life and prayed for me so fervently. I think that I'm here today because of my mother's prayers. Then I think of my lovely wife who's a godly woman and a godly mother and loves the children and been devoted to them and what an influence she's had on her life. And I thought about how rich I am and I shot text out to all my three daughters who are mothers and told them I love them. Happy Mother's Day. I'm proud of them. They're devoted to their children. So what a rich man I feel that I am this morning with all these godly women and mothers that surround me and the blessing that they brought to my life. So when I read that scripture, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. I think that is so true of my own life because of the godly women that God has put into my life. Now I want to give you the five qualities of a virtuous mother. This is not exhaustive by any means, and the list could be quite lengthy, but I want you to write these down if you're taking notes. Five qualities of the virtuous mother. Number one, she's a help to her husband. She is a helper to her husband. Verse 11 and 12. Go back there with me in your Bibles. The psalmist or the proverb writer said, the heart of her husband does safely trust her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She does him good, not evil, all the days of her life. Now, I want to make this point that motherhood starts with marriage. Motherhood starts with marriage. Now, years ago, a preacher wouldn't have to make that point. But we see the demise of marriage. We see the demise of male and female today. You know, in our culture today, we don't even know what a woman is. How can we celebrate motherhood if we don't know what a woman is? You got a woman that has been going to be appointed to the Supreme Court and she can't answer the question of what a woman is? God have mercy on our nation. Or we have women thinking they're men and men thinking they're women and we've got gender dysphoria and confusion. And we don't understand that God made them male and God made them female. And God said, for this cause, a man would leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. The foundation for marriage, and by the way, let me make it perfectly clear, marriage is a divine institution. And it's not like, well, we we have Christian marriage over here and secular marriage over here. No, no. Marriage is God's design. There's only one kind of marriage, and that's God's design for marriage. Anything outside of that is not marriage. And I wrote it down, four things that are marriage in God's description. It's conjugal. It's a heterosexual. It's a monogamous, covenantal relationship between one man and one woman. And in God's economy, it's one mate for life. What God has joined together that no man put asunder. Even Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, when he was asked about the subject of marriage, he said, have you not read in the scriptures that he which made them, made them male and female? Jesus wasn't confused. He made them male and female, said for this cause a man leaves father and mother, cleaves to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Now in Genesis 2.24, where we have the foundation for marriage as God designed it, We see three building blocks. There's severance, leave father and mother. There's permanence, cleave to his wife or be glued to his wife. And there's intimacy. That's why I said it's a conjugal relationship. And the two become one flesh. And it's a speaking of their conjugal rights. And so intimacy, so severance, permanence, and intimacy, the two become one flesh, is a marriage relationship as God has designed it. But there's a verse in Hebrews chapter 13 that says marriage is honorable in all and the bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So any sexual relationships outside the covenant relationship of marriage as God designed it is sinful behavior and it brings the judgment of God. And we're reaping what we've sown in America today because we've abandoned God and we've abandoned his word. All the confusion about abortion these last week breaks my heart to see our confusion. Not only is marriage a divine institution, but life is sacred and life is from God. From the moment of conception. And we're so confused today about the 
subject of abortion, we need to think biblically and scripturally. It's so very, very important. Now, she's a helper to her husband. Look at this, that she's trustworthy, verse 11. The heart of her husband does safely trust her. A marriage must be built on trust. A marriage must be built on trust. He shall have no need of spoil. She shall do him good, verse 12, all the days of her life, and not evil. In other words, he can give her a credit card. (laughs) She can say, I'm going shopping, and he doesn't have a heart attack. He trusts her. And the heart of her husband doth safely trust her. So I, I, love, the, I love the truth that, that marriage is based on trust. You can't, you can't lie in your marriage. I, I, when I'm doing pre-marriage counseling, I emphasize this so much with couples. Never violate your spouse's trust. Never violate your spouse's trust. If you do, you're going to really damage your marriage. It's really hard to regain once it has been violated. So her husband does trust in her. So she's submissive and supportive as well. Hebrews, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, 5, verse 22 to 24, their favorite verse every woman's memorized and loves. Wives, submit to your husbands. You go, Pastor, I thought this was a Mother's Day message going to encourage us. <laughs> You have to start with marriage. You have to start with submission. Yes. In order to be a godly mother, you must be a godly wife. And to be a godly wife, you must be submitted to your husband. That doesn't mean you're less important. It doesn't mean that you're inferior. It's for the sake of order in the home that there be not chaos or confusion. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, headship doesn't mean dictatorship, doesn't mean superiority, it's just the position he holds as the head who is a provider and protector on the home. So the, an or, the, the arrangement God has given to us in the family, a husband who sacrificially loves his wife and a wife who sacrificially submits to her husband's leadership and headship in the home. She's supportive and trust. Worthy. And in Ephesians 5, verse 33, Paul says, Wives, see that you respect your husbands, and husbands, see that you love your wives. So she's properly related to her husband in marriage. And then secondly, write it down, she's hardworking as a homemaker. She's a hardworking homemaker. The home is her priority. Not exclusively does she work in the home. The picture is she works outside the home, but the priority is her home. Now, this is recorded for us in verse 13, all the way down to verse 25. I'm not going to read every verse, but in verse 13 to verse 25, we have a picture of her hardworking domestic duties. Now, in verse 27, peek at it with me, she watches over the affairs of her household. I love that statement. She watches over the affairs of her household. She gives herself full attention to her household. And then it says that she eats not the bread of idleness. So she doesn't sit around in her nightgown and slippers and curlers in her hair watching soap operas all day. I just thought I'd throw that in to bless you again today. All through this passage, we have a picture, and I'm going to give you 10 pictures of her, of a hard-working wife and mother. She gets up early. Look at verse 15. She rises while it is night and gives food to her household and a portion to her maiden. So she gets up early. And then secondly, look at verse 13. She sews. She's busy with her hands. Look at verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. This is her making the cloths. She stretches out her hand to the poor, and she reaches forth her hands to the needy. Now there's actually six, or excuse me, seven times her hands are mentioned being busy. Her hands are mentioned in verse 13. Her hands are mentioned in verse 16. 
Her hands are mentioned in verse 19 twice. Her hands are mentioned again in verse 20 twice. And then her hands are mentioned again in verse 31. So this woman has busy hands. Her hands, her heart, her home, her mouth is used for the glory of God. So she gets up early, verse 15. She's busy sewing with her hands. And then you guys, you ladies will love this, verse 14. She shops, praise God. (laughs) She's like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. I love that verse. It reminds me of when Christy would go shopping when our kids were young and she would take the minivan. Yes, we had a minivan. (laughs) And uh, the garage door would open and the kids would hear that and they would start jumping up and down. Mom's home, mom's home. We're going to eat, we're going to eat. (laughs) We're not going to starve to death. And then everyone would be involved in bringing the groceries and they're all looking for the ice cream, right? (laughs) Looking for the cookies and all the good stuff. And mom, did you get donuts and all that jazz? But it's like a ship. It used to be like a big ship coming in the (laughs) dock. And you're unloading all the goods, you know, and it's just a beautiful picture. She's like the merchant ships, verse 14. She brings her food from afar. What a blessed picture that is of this virtuous wife. She feeds her household, and then again in verse 15. And then fifthly, she's enterprising in verse 16. And verse 24, verse 16, she considers a field, she buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. Look down at verse 24. It says there in verse 24 that she makes linen, fine linen. She sells it. She, de- she delivers girdles unto the merchants. So she's enterprising. And then sixthly, she's the last one to bed at night. So she's the first one to get up in the morning, verse 15. And then she's the last one to go to bed at night, verse 18. She perceives that her merchandise is good. And her candle goes out not by night. So she works late into the night. So we know the old saying is a man's work is from sun to sun, but a woman's work is what? There's only the women saying that right there. (laughs) The men are kind of like, I don't know about that. I can't tell you how many times my wife is up early. She stays up late. There's always work to be done. A woman's work is never done. But I love this verse 20. She's also compassionate and benevolent. This is the seventh quality I see here in verse 20. She stretches out her hand. In the Hebrew, it's she opens her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hand to the needy. And as I pointed out, there are seven references to her hands. So she's caring and concerned. She's a philanthropist. She reaches out to help those who are in need. And then eighthly, notice in verse 21, She makes preparations for her family. It says she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. And then ninthly, in verse 22, she is well-dressed. All this, and she's a woman of beauty too. Verse 22, it says she maketh herself coverings of tapestry, and her clothing is silk and purple. So she takes care of herself as well. And then tenth and lastly, she has dignity and joyful confidence. In verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. So what a a beautiful picture this is of this virtuous or excellent woman that this mother tells her son you are to look for in a wife. Write down Proverbs 14, verse 1. It says, every wise woman builds her house but a foolish woman plucks it down with her hands. So the point I want to make before we move on is, ladies, wives, mothers, women, make your home a priority. Now, I know that if I were to say women shouldn't work outside the home, that I would get daggers staring at me. And even after preaching this sermon first service, I can sometimes, just when I start to get to the point, I can feel feel everyone stiffen up a little bit. I'm not saying a woman can't work outside the home, but I will say this. 
The priority is the home. The priority is your walk with God, the commitment to your husband, your marriage, and then your children. How do you expect to be a good mother if you're not a good wife? The best thing you can do is model for your children what a wife is to be. Same for the husband, for the kids. So you have to get your priorities straight and make sure that the home doesn't suffer, your marriage doesn't suffer, your walk with God is a priority, and your relationship to your husband is so very important. Jesus in John 13 washed the disciples' feet, and Jesus said, He that would be the greatest among you, let him be what? The servant of all. So you should have a servant husband and a servant mom and a servant wife, but the priority should be the home. And for the husbands, your priority is God, your wife, and then your children. The best thing you can do for your kids is to love your wife. Best thing you can do for your children is to love your husband and to give them a strong marriage in the home. Now, number three, this virtuous, excellent woman, she uses her mouth for good. Jump down to verse 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Now, two things happen when she opens her mouth. Her words are wise, and her words are kind. What a great virtue that is. They're wise, and they're kind. Now, the question is, why? Why are her words so wise and so kind? And my answer to that is, is she's a woman of the word. She's hidden God's word in her heart. Remember when Hannah prayed for a son and God gave her a son, but she said, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him to you all the days of his life. She's one of the great mothers of the Bible, Hannah. She wanted to be a mother and she prayed and God gave her the son Samuel who became a great one of the great prophets of the Bible. But then you have Hannah's song. It's much like Mary's Magnificent. And every word in Hannah's song, very close to Mary's Magnificent, is actually all Scripture. She opens her mouth and Scripture just gushes forth. She opens her lips with praise to the Lord and prayer, and all that comes out is the Word of God. So my encouragement to these mothers today is hide God's Word in your heart. Quote the scriptures, sing the scriptures, pray the scriptures. Be a woman of the word. You can never underestimate the power of the, wife, the, the mother sharing scriptures with her children. Teach your children the word of God. So her mouth is wise and kind because she knows God's word. And she is filled with the Holy Spirit. Those are the two reasons I give for her being this virtuous woman who has these wise and kind words. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. And the minute he says that in that passage, he says, speaking, verse 19, to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. So a Spirit-filled Mother is a singing mother. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. And what a blessing that is. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And then Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, the grievous words stir up strife. So, ladies, let the word of God dwell in you richly and let the spirit of God control your heart and your mind and fill you. How important that is. So you use your words to pray. Use your words to praise. You use your words to proclaim and instruct the, the children and the grandchildren in the things of God's word. Here's quality number four, if you're taking notes. She's devoted to her children. So she's a helper to her husband. She's hardworking in the home. She uses her mouth for good and the glory of God. And then fourthly, she's devoted to her children. Look at verse 27 to 29. She looks well to the ways of her household 
She eats not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed or bless her. Her husband also praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but you have excelled them all. Her children rise up and call her blessed. In Psalm 113, verse 9, the psalmist says, He makes the barren woman to be a keeper of house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. What a blessing that is. Too many times Christian women today feel like they're second class because they're a stay-home mom or or they're just staying home taking care of the kids. And that life is passing them by, diaper after diaper after diaper after diaper. I believe that's your greatest contribution to society today is to raise a godly generation. I'm absolutely convinced that one of the problems we have in our culture today is the breakdown in the home. The home is the building block of society. As goes the home, so goes the world. All this political talk on liberal television and conservative TV and all the talk, talk, talk of the politicians, and it's so simple that we miss it. We've forgotten God and His Word. When you get back to the Bible, back to God's design for marriage, back to making marriage and raising children a priority in our nation. And obviously not farming our kids out to the government, that's for sure. If they're going to learn about things, they need to learn them at home from a godly mother and godly father. In Psalm 127, verse 4, the children are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man that has those arrows and has a quiver full of them. Think of the impact for good that you can have mothers. Jochebed, the mother of Moses. Who's heard of Jochebed? If I said, what do you think about Jochebed? Very few of you would really even know who jo- Jochebed who. But can you imagine having on your chariot a bumper sticker? My son gave us the Ten Commandments. <laughs> My son is Moses. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. Pretty impressive. But Jochebed only had Moses for a short period of time before she had to drop him off in the court of Pharaoh. So in those very early formative years, Jochebed instilled in Moses what he needed to guide him through those difficult years. What an impact she had. I think of Hannah. I've already mentioned the mother of Samuel, the prophet. He's one of my favorite Bible characters, Samuel. is a godly man who influenced the nation, appointed the first king, brought the nation back to God. Comes to the end of his life and said, I haven't stole anything. I haven't lied to anybody. Can anyone accuse me of any evil? He had an impeccable life. And the influence of Hannah is true in his life. And she, too, had to give him to the Lord. Remember when Hannah took Samuel as a little boy to the temple and the temple priests were corrupt and she had to leave him there? Now, we dedicate babies here at the church, but we give them back to mom and dad to take home. We don't keep them. Praise God. We give them back to mother and father, but she had to give him up. But she had instilled principles in little Samuel that guided him through his whole life through. I think of Elizabeth. What a sweet, precious, aged saint she was, the mother of John the Baptist. Can you imagine your son is John the Baptist? You know what Jesus said about that guy? No one greater than John the Baptist. That's pretty heavy. When Jesus makes a compliment like that, it's pretty good. But I think of the godly influence Elizabeth had and the priest Zacharias on John the Baptist. Then I think about the grandmother and the mother Lois and Eunice who raised Timothy that God used so wonderfully. And then I think about Mary, what a great mother she was, the mother of Jesus. How blessed she was to have the Son of God and to train Him, and He grew in stature and favor with God and man. Now here is my last point in verse 30 and 31. A virtuous, excellent mother or woman is a woman who fears the Lord. And this is the most important quality. This is the source and the secret of her excellence. 
Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. It means it's like an empty, hollow bubble that just pops with nothing in it. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be what? Praised. So give her of the fruit of her hands. There's her hands again. And let her own works praise her in the gates. The secret and the source of her excellence is she's a woman that fears the Lord. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 17, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Whether you're a woman or a man, a husband or a wife, you fear the Lord. That's important. That's the source of your strength and the secret of your excellence. What does it mean to fear the Lord? It means that you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. Nothing comes between you and the Lord. He is the priority of your life. Everything you are flows out from that walking with the Lord, that fear of the Lord. You become a woman of excellence. Now notice the charm is deceptive and beauty does not last. You can do all that you can do to keep yourself looking nice, but sooner or later, it happens. But if you have an inner beauty, 1 Peter chapter 3 says, whose adorning is not the outward, the plaiting of the hair, the wearing of gold and apparel, but the hidden person of the heart. Peter says it's the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. So the outer beauty fades, but the inner beauty grows stronger as the years go by. Amen? And what a blessed thing that is. So make that the priority of your lives, to fear and love the Lord. So she knows the Lord. That's what it means to fear God. She's saved. She loves the Lord. She's seeking Him. She lives for the Lord. She's serving the Lord. So what a blessed thing this woman is, this virtuous, excellent woman, a woman who fears the Lord. She shall be praised. Let's pray.